this is, I think, one of the interesting things that you can do with this notion of a Berkovich space that seems much harder to do from the point of view of classical rigid analysis, which is that uh, you can take a real valued function and say what it means to be harmonic or subharmonic. And such functions satisfy many of the usual properties familiar from complex analysis, and they also appear quite naturally. In the last lecture, I'll give some examples of coming from the theory of heights, these local height functions that come up in arithmetic geometry are ex examples of things that tend to be uh, harmonic or subharmonic in appropriate domains. And this is well known over the complex numbers, but periodically you, there's apparently no way to make these definitions. But when you use Berkovich spaces, it becomes very natural. And so what I want to do is give an introduction to this theory. But the way that uh, Rumley and I developed this theory in our book, or the way that Thuyé does it in his thesis, uh, is you have to first develop certain machinery of Laplacians, and then you say that harmonic functions are where the Laplacian is zero. And I want to reverse the, for, for pedagogical purposes, I want to reverse the order here and define harmonic functions first in a somewhat ad hoc way, uh, but which is more intuitive. And so you can see right away what the content of the theory is. And then in the next lecture tomorrow, I will define the Laplacian operator and we'll see that the harmonic functions can be characterized in, as satisfying some differential equation. So I'll do this only in the context of M of Z, which I'll start out with as a nice, cute example with no applications that I know of. Uh, and then in the context of Berkovich projective line, which, which does have some applications. And Thuyé does this more generally for curves. As far as I know of, in higher dimensions, we still don't have good definitions of harmonic and subharmonic functions, but there, there are some ideas out there for how, how to do this. Uh, but I will focus on the case of curves. So K, as always for me, is algebraically closed and complete, and non-Archimedean, and non-trivial. Non-trivial absolute value. And a domain, I think I haven't used, well, I talked about simple domains. So in general, a domain is a connected open set. And I'll always talk about the Berkovich topology when I say connected. And that's the same as path connected. So we introduced the following uh, notation for points of M of Z. In the last lecture, I talked about the Berkovich space associated to Z. And I classified the points. So I just want to give those points names rather than calling them semi-norms, which is a little awkward. I'll use this zeta notation from the first lecture. So zeta infinity epsilon is that point which corresponds to the Archimedean norm, the usual Archimedean norm to the epsilon power. Zeta p epsilon is the epsilon power of the p-adic norm. And remember, the range of epsilon is different in these two cases. Zeta naught is the trivial norm, the point corresponding to the trivial norm. And zeta p infinity is that p-trivial semi-norm. So there was the picture again of the Berkovich spectrum of Z. And those p-trivial seminorms are here. And in the path metric, they're infinitely far away. Uh, so I, I did a compromise here. If, if, if I draw it this way, it's hard to draw them infinitely far away. I tried to make it, this segment a little longer. So you can see that these points should be thought of as further away. But I couldn't draw them infinitely far. Bjorn t told me that if I had drawn each segment a bit shorter than the previous one, then actually you, you see the Berkovich topology uh, as just this sort of Euclidean topology embedded in, in, in R2. So um, I drew it in neither of those two ways. So the tangent directions in M of Z uh, is something interesting. I, I guess I already discussed this, but you can define the set of tangent directions as the connected component of the complement or as equivalent classes of paths emanating from X. And I, as I discussed, for the trivial semi-norm, zeta naught, there's a canonical bijection between the set of tangent directions and the, and the set of places of Q. And at all other points, the tangent space has cardinality either one or two. And I'll call sub V the branch 
emanating from zeta naught in the direction v. So in that picture, you have the trivial norm and you have these different segments uh, that are attached at the trivial norm. And so L sub v is the one corresponding to the direction v. v is indexed by the places of q or by the tangent vectors. And hz is the complement of these infinitely far away points. And the points at, these are the ones at finite distance from the center point. And the metric topology is not the same as the Berkovich topology. So all these things I said already. Um, now I want to define an affine function. So I'll just define at first the, uh, well, harmonic functions should be uh, affine in some sense. So let me say what that means in this context. I'll give a more general definition later. So if you have a real valued function, but maybe it's allowed to be plus or minus infinity at the infinite endpoints of the tree, it's affine if, first of all, its restriction to each uh, branch just looks like um, t goes to a t plus b, where a and b depend on the branch. And I want to require uh, that it's constant on all but finitely many branches so that the a sub v's are almost all zero. So that's what I'll mean in shorthand by an affine function. And if we have an affine function, we can define this delta at zeta naught of f to be minus the sum of the slopes of f in all directions. So at this trivial point, I'm defining this operator which takes an affine function to this negative sum of the slopes in all directions leading away from that point. And the minus sign is there, so it's a minus the sum of the a sub v's. And all but finally many a sub v's are zero, so this makes sense. The minus sign is there just for some conventions so that later I'll define, define the Laplacian on a graph and I want it to agree with the usual combinatorial Laplacian for affine functions. And so I need this minus sign. Uh, so motivated by this classical notion of harmonic functions on a graph, where you just have somehow the value on a graph, you can talk about functions just on the vertices. On an unweighted graph, you could just say the value at the center is the average of the neighbor values. And that would be harmonic. And, and in Teitelbaum's talk, we saw something like this. Um, and actually, he had harmonic co-cycles. Those were function on the edges. But anyway, you can, these are related. Um, so you have, on a weighted graph, instead of just taking the average, you take a weighted average. And in fact, saying that the value at the center is the weighted average of the values at the neighbors is like looking at the change in value and summing those, right? So it's like looking at the derivative in different directions and adding them together. So uh, if this is zero, if the sum of all these derivatives is zero, you call the function harmonic at, at this point. And somehow in M of Z, there's only one interesting point, right? Everything else is it's kind of obvious what, there's no interesting definitions except at this point where we have a different kind of topology and different behavior. So at zeta naught, we'll say a function is harmonic if this sum of the slopes is zero. Okay, so here's an example. Take log absolute value n, where n is a non-zero integer. But so on M of A in general, if A is a Bonnach ring, you think of A as the ring of functions on M of A. And so somehow the integer N is like an analytic function on Z, on, on the Berkovich space Z. And so log absolute value N, uh, well, the, the, the lemma is that the function X goes to again, for sign conventions, I'll say minus log absolute value n sub x is an affine function and it's harmonic at this point. And so this is somehow like the classical fact. If you take a non-zero analytic function, log absolute value f is harmonic. It's the real part of an analytic function. Um, so the proof, so along the branch L sub v, this function minus log absolute value n is linear with slope equal to minus log absolute value n sub v. So remember the, um, the usual absolute, when I say absolute value n sub v, that's sort of the usual normalized absolute value, and those are the points of distance one away. So it's easy to, to see that this is the case. This, 
absolute value n sub x. Remember, each of these branches were just powers of some fixed semi-norms. So when you take logs, you get linear functions. So if you know the value at one point, it's just linear on the rest. So just tautologically, uh, this function is linear along each branch, and the slope is minus log absolute value n. So in particular, for all places v, such that absolute value n sub v is 1, which is all but finitely many, the slope is 0. So now the fact that it's harmonic is the same as the product formula. Right? The sum of the slopes is just the sum of log absolute value n sub v, which by the product formula is 0. So in other words, the product formula has a direct translation into the language of Berkovich spaces that um, this function log absolute value n is harmonic at this trivial point. So it's somehow a cute observation, but it, the analog for the Berkovich projective line it has more, somehow more substance, uh, but I think this example is nice to keep in mind since it's a bit simpler. Uh, so somehow we can translate the product formula into the statement that this function is harmonic. Okay, so um, when I talk about Laplacians, I'll come back to this example and, and, and compute Laplacians on the Berkovich space associated to Z, and we'll see that that has interesting interpretation in terms of heights of algebraic numbers. But for now, let me go to harmonic functions on the projective line, which is a little more complicated. So for an extended real-valued function, we want to know what it means to be um, harmonic. But in fact, harmonic functions will be real-valued. Um, and this is more complicated uh, somehow because the branching behavior is much wilder. Uh, so now recall that the set of tangent directions uh, at a point x of Berkovich space has the cardinality of the residue field if x is of type 2. And otherwise, there's either two or one elements. So the points of type 1 and 4 are boundary points, and there's only one direction you can go. Uh, but you've got an infinite number of points of where there's infinitely many branches coming out. And so somehow the notion of a harmonic function is slightly less obvious than what I just defined. But it's, it's similar. So one more time, there's the picture to keep in mind. So I want to say what it means for a function to be harmonic at the Gauss point, or more generally, on some, at all points of some domain. OK, so let's let u be a, a domain, a connected open set in the projective line. And let's look at a, uh, an extended real-valued function, which is finite-valued on uh, hyperbolic space. And I want to talk about what it means to be piecewise affine, because now I have so many branches that there's no natural notion of sort of completely affine. But just piecewise, I'll write f is in CPA of u if, first of all, it's continuous. Second of all, the restriction to hyperbolic space is piecewise affine with respect to this path metric. So what does that mean exactly? I mean that for any point of view in hyperbolic space and each tangent vector, a tangent vector is an equivalence class of paths. So you take a representative path, uh, and then the restriction to that little segment, that you know, moving in the direction v is some little segment, and the restriction to that segment should just have this form, a, a t plus b. So, um, and for each point, I want all but finitely many of the a sub v's to be zero. So in other words, um, for all but finitely many tangent vectors at any given point, you're constant in, the, in that direction. But you can have finitely many directions emanating from the point in which the function is sort of linear but not constant. And, and now, for, for such a piecewise affine function, you can talk about these directional derivatives the derivative of f in the direction of v. And that's just that number a sub v. And all but finitely many of those are 0 by definition at each point. So for each point x, this delta x sub f minus the sum of the slopes is well defined. And so now if I have a real valued function on a domain, I'll say that it's harmonic. Uh, 
if it's continuous piecewise affine, and at every point of the domain it's harmonic, meaning either that the sum of the slopes is zero, or, uh, or that it's constant on an open neighborhood of x. Is it a question? Not quite. I'm allowing a sort of infinite, uh, I mean, it has to be, you say, locally finite, but it, it can branch out infinitely far towards the endpoints. So, um, like the Bruja Tits tree, you, you could take a function that sort of along each segment there is affine and then extend it by just constant values to the rest of the Berkovich space. And, and that would be an example of a continuous piecewise affine function. Right, continuous for the Berkovich. It would make sense. The question is, do you need continuity for the Berkovich topology? Um, well, it, it's desirable. So. You'd like to have some control of the values at the type 1 points, for example, because, I mean, of the things I'm going to say. And those are infinitely far away. So uh, it's here, here I do want to use the Berkowitz topology. It's not necessary to make sense of this delta x of h or anything. But for some global, I mean, for, for properties of harmonic functions, you really want it to be continuous in a strong sense. Um, subharmonic functions, which I'll talk about later, you can weak, significantly weaken this continuity requirement. So I, I'm just distinguishing, I mean, really being constant on an open neighborhood of x is the same as somehow saying that in the direction going from this type 1 point towards the tree, the one direction you can go, the slope is 0. So it's really the same as the sum of the slopes is 0. It's just since it's infinitely far away, it would be hard to directly define the directional derivative since all lengths of paths are infinite. So just to avoid infinities, I'm making a somewhat ad hoc looking definition separating out at these points at the endpoints of the tree. I just, I just want it to be locally constant. And then, um, and then at the points of hyperbolic space, I want the sum of the slopes in all directions to be 0. OK, but we'll see this is sort of just saying the, the, the Laplacian is, is 0. Uh, in, in, in some sense to be defined later. So there's a, a very natural definition here, but intuitively this is what it will translate to. And he, here's one example, possibly not the simplest example I could have chosen as the first example, but take the function uh, which is infinity at infinity and then is otherwise given by the log of the max of absolute value of t and 1. So th this is somehow extending this function log plus absolute value x. And the claim is that this is harmonic except at the Gauss point and at infinity. Uh, so why is that? Well, so let lambda be the, the, the closed path from the Gauss point to infinity. So that's running from that center point up, up to infinity. And let r lambda be the retraction map onto, onto lambda. So the claim is that here's what this function g looks like. The extension of log plus to Berkovich space looks like this. It's just linear with slope 1 along lambda. So along the path lambda, you're just measuring the distance from the Gauss point to x. And then it's locally constant away from lambda. So to figure out the value at any point, you just retract onto this segment and take the value there. And so now, so this is a clearly continuous piecewise affine function. And um, well, uh, clearly uh, what you can see is that by this description, the sum of the slopes in all directions is 0. Because for example, on lambda, you've got one slope going towards the Gauss point and one slope going up towards infinity. And the s one is 1 and 1 is minus 1. And when you add them, they cancel out. And so the only place where the sum of the slopes doesn't cancel out is at the Gauss point, in which case, some of the slopes is 1, because you have one direction going up where the slope is minus 1, I guess. And then you have um, 
or uh, okay, I'm getting confused about the signs. But anyway, you some of the slopes is either one or minus one, and you um, yeah, the sum of the sorry, some of the slopes is one because you have it's increasing going up to infinity. So you have slope one, and in all other directions it's constant. So you have slope zero. And similarly, it's not harmonic at infinity because it's not locally constant. The neighborhoods of infinity are just balls, uh, Berkovich open disks. So I guess I didn't say this, but because the Berkovich topology restricts to the usual topology on P1 of K, at a type 1 point, the basic open neighborhoods are just disks. But at points like a type 2 point, a basic open neighborhood is more complicated. It's one of these simple domains. But anyway, so to be locally constant near infinity just means is it constant on every small disk containing infinity? And clearly, this is not. So it's increasing to the value plus infinity. So that's one example. Another example would be this. Take uh, an affinoid subdomain uh, endowed with some choice of a Bonnach norm and take this m of a sub v, this Berkovich space uh, that I defined earlier today. And uh, take a connected open subset in the Berkovich topology for, for, the, for this. And if f is a nowhere zero analytic function, then log absolute value f is harmonic. So this is like what I was describing for m of z. But it, it, it works for these general affinoid subdomains of p1. And this generalizes the, this fact that in the complex plane, log of the absolute value of a non-zero analytic function is harmonic. Um, uh, yeah, so the question is, oh, I see. Uh, right, so nowhere zero analytic function. Well, it, the question was whether it's required to be nowhere zero on all of V or just on u. Um, I think I meant what I said. Uh, whether there's something stronger you can say, I'm not sure. But what I said is, is OK. So the, the, there's a maximum principle for harmonic functions. And this is one of the striking things about this, this, this theory, about this definition. So the following maximum principle is true. If you have a non-constant harmonic function on a domain, then it does not achieve its maximum or minimum value on u. And if h extends continuously to the closure of u, then it achieves its minimum and maximum value somewhere on the boundary. Of course, that's sort of formal consequence of part one. But uh, uh, so the maximum values are achieved on the boundary. And the most interesting case of this is for simple domains when the boundary is a finite set of points. And you can guarantee that a harmonic function will achieve its maximum value somewhere at one of those points. And the proof of this is sort of related to the maximum principle for graphs. I mean, I mentioned you have a notion of harmonic functions on a graph, and you have a maximum principle there. And this is somehow extending to the inverse limit over all graphs. So let me give you one consequence of the maximum principle. So a simple domain is a connected open set with finitely many boundary points. And ha they have to be of type 2 or 3. Every harmonic function on a simple domain extends continuously to v bar. So this is some lemma you can prove. Uh, so this condition about extending is, is automatic. And as a consequence, uh, if V is either the whole Berkovich projective line, in which case its boundary is sort of empty, or if you have an open disk, in which case the boundary is a single point. Right? Remember, like a typical open disk, I had that picture, uh, all points lying in one direction from a given point. And that given point at which you're emanating from is the unique boundary point of a disk. So an di open disk in Berkovich space has one boundary point. And so by the maximum principle, we conclude that if u is all of p1 Burke, or is an open disk, every harmonic function on u is constant. Right? Because it has to achieve both its maximum and minimum values on the boundary. So if there's only one or zero boundary points, it must be constant. And more generally, 
Well, more generally, um, let, let me just go back. So if you have uh, a finite number of boundary points, then in a minute we'll see a Poisson type formula that expresses the value of a harmonic function in the interior of the domain in terms of its values on the boundary, and which is reminiscent of what we saw in um, Teitelbaum's talk this morning, but he's doing p-adic valued functions, and these are real valued functions, so it's not exactly the same thing. But uh, before I get to the uh, Poisson formula, I want to point out that the behavior of a harmonic function is controlled by what it does on a very special subset. So originally, I can sort of allow uh, a lot of branching uh, in many different directions, but in fact, um, here, here's what you can show. So if I have a domain, I'll define, uh, this is Robert Rumley's terminology, the main dendrite of the domain, D of U, to be the set of all points in U which belong to paths between boundary points. So I take all the boundary points and I draw all paths between them and I look at all the points of U that lie in between boundary points. That's called uh, the main dendrite. So for example, for a disk, there's only one boundary point, so the main dendrite is empty. If I have an annulus, there's two boundary points, and uh, the main dendrite is the seg open segment running from one boundary point to the other. So if I take an open disk minus a smaller closed disk, then the two sort of points corresponding to those disks, uh, the main dendrite is the segment joining them. And remember, here's a picture of an annulus. So this open segment is the main dendrite. This, sorry, this open segment right here. And the, the important topological fact about this main dendrite is this. Lemma, if the main dendrite is, is not empty, then it's, I guess it's true if it's empty also, um, then it's finitely branched at each point. So this is sort of a locally finite tree. Okay, I have an arbitrary connected open subset of Berkovich space, and I draw all paths between all boundary points. It could actually be quite complicated. I mean, the boundary might be un an uncountable set, for example. But uh, it's necessarily a locally finite tree. And this follows from the compactness of Berkovich space. I won't give it official proof, but it, it's a consequence of compactness. So here's a typical example. If you take, if your field is CP for concreteness and you delete uh, the points, the P1 of QP, then the main dendrite is the bruhat titz tree. The geometric realization of the bruhat titz tree. So it's a locally finite real tree in which you have a discrete set of branch points and each branch point has degree P plus one. And so this is a typical sort of picture of what the, the main dendrite will look like. It'll be some finitely branched tree, but possibly in, infinite. So uh, here's the connection. If you have a domain and a harmonic function on the domain, then, well, first of all, as I said, if the main dendrite's empty, then H is constant by the maximum modulus principle. More generally, it's constant off of the main dendrite. So on the main dendrite, it will be an affine function, and everywhere away from that main dendrite, this locally finite tree, it will be constant. So you can figure out the value of a point just by retracting to this locally finite tree. So um, that, that's, that's the result which describes, uh, I mean, you can now sort of understand harmonic functions in terms of this description. And let's look at the case of a simple domain because it's, it's, it's interesting what happens. So classically, if you have a harmonic function on a disk, on an open disk, say, then it has a continuous extension to the, to the closure, which is the closed disk. And the Poisson formula relates the value, the values of f on the open disk in terms of the values along the boundary. Now, if, okay, so, so for example, if v is an open disk of radius r centered at z naught in the complex plane, and f is a harmonic function, so it extends continuously, and the value at the center is just the average along the boundary, average value of f along the boundary. And so it's the integral of f against this measure mu sub v. Mu sub v is the uniform measure d theta over 2 pi on this boundary circle. Now, in general, um, 
if you have a point that's not in the center of the disk, there's still a, a Poisson formula, but it's some kind of uh, visual average or weighted average of the boundary values. So there's a measure that depends only on the point and on the disk called the Jensen Poisson measure for which the value of any harmonic function f at z is just given by integrating f against this boundary measure. So this is very classical stuff. Uh, and I claim there's a sort of very precise analog of this for Berkovich space. Now these disks in, in C, disks are the basic open neighborhoods of points. In Berkovich space, the simple domains are the basic open sets. And so one would like a description not just for disks, in which case there are no non-constant harmonic functions on disks, so it wouldn't be very interesting. But for simple domains, it's an interesting theory. So what happens is um, every harmonic function, I already mentioned this, on a simple domain extends continuously to the closure. And there's an analog of this Jensen Poisson measure, which gives you an explicit formula for any harmonic function inside this domain in terms of its values on the boundary. So, so you can explicitly solve the Dirichlet problem on Berkovich space for simple domains. So here's how it works. I'm going to sort of give you a very explicit construction of how you reconstruct the values of a harmonic function from the boundary values. So it's convenient to define the um, Gromov product, x, y sub z, as the distance in this path metric from w to z, where w is the first point where the unique paths from x to z and y to z intersect. So here's what this is. You take two points in hyperbolic space, uh, and you have a third reference point, z. You take from x to z, there's a unique path. From y to z, there's a unique path. And there'll be some first point where those paths intersect. You take the distance from that point to your reference point, z. And that is the Gromov product. Explicitly, if you don't like that description, it's just defined in terms of the metric in this way. It's half of the distance from x to z plus the distance from y to z minus the distance from x to y. This is an easy exercise. And this actually occurs in Gromov's theory of hyperbolic spaces. So real trees are the zero hyperbolic spaces. And in general, there's some notion of delta hyperbolic spaces that's defined using this Gromov product. So th this fits into some more general picture. And now in terms of the Gromov product, I claim it's just a matter of linear algebra to find this Jensen Poisson measure explicitly. So here's the recipe. You start with a simple domain V with finitely many boundary points X1 through Xm. A probability vector is some real vector with non-negative entries which add up to 1. We can identify such things with boundary measures because our boundary is just finite. So a, a boundary measure is just basically given by a probability vector. Uh, and so lemma for each z in my simple domain, and I want to, for the moment, to exclude type 1 points, but we'll see how to deal with them in a second. So for each uh, point that's not of type 1 in, in v, I claim there's a unique probability vector, h1 of z through hm of z, for which this quantity is independent of i. So what is this quantity? So I'm taking h1 of z times the Gromov product of x1 and xi plus dot 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 plus hm of z times the Gromov product xi and xm. So a priori, this is a, a function of i. For whatever real numbers you would pick here, this would be some function of i. And there's a unique choice of a vector which makes this independent of i. So this is somehow linear algebra. And now, if you want, given that it's unique, you can solve for it using Kramer's formula or whatever you want from, from linear algebra to give an explicit formula for these. So, so here's the connection. hi now you think of as a function of z. So for each z, I get this vector h1 of z through hm of z, probability vector. And so the function that sends z to hi of z 
Well, I only defined it for z in hyperbolic space, but by continuity, since those points are dense, you can show this extends uniquely to a map from v bar to r. And this is called the ith harmonic measure. So this has a classical analog, uh, which is, um, you'll see the connection in a minute. So the claim is first, this is a harmonic function. So because of the way this Gromov product is defined, I mean, it takes a little bit of work to sort through all the definitions and see that this is true. But uh, this hi that I've just constructed is, in fact, a harmonic function. I've very explicitly written down a harmonic function. And the values of hi on the boundary are just given by this formula. hi at the jth boundary point is delta ij. So I found m functions, which are 1 at one of the boundary points and 0 at the other boundary points. And so now it's a simple matter to express to, uh, sort of the values of a harmonic function at a point in terms of the boundary values, because I sort of have a basis for such functions now. So by construction, these hi of z's were all probability vectors. So the hi of z is always between 0 and 1, and the sum of these guys is always 1. And by continuity, that still holds on v bar. So now here's the Poisson formula. Take a simple domain V whose boundary points are x1 through xm. Then there's a, each harmonic function extends continuously to the boundary. There's a unique such function with a pres prescribed set of boundary values. And F can be recovered from its boundary values using this formula. So F of Z is just going to be the sum over all boundary points of F of xi times hi of Z. And this works for all Z. So you can recover the value of a harmonic function in, inside V and on the boundary um, in this way. It's some weighted average of the values on the boundary. The hi of z's are the weights. So we could say this in terms of a Jensen Poisson measure. Right? So just define a measure that depends on the point z and on the domain V, but not on any choice of a harmonic function f. Take the delta masses, point masses at each of the boundary points, and the weights are given by hi of z. So then the Poisson formula is the following. If I have a simple domain, a continuous function from v bar to r is harmonic if and only if f of z is the integral of f against this Jensen Poisson measure. So to be harmonic uh, is actually equivalent on a simple domain to saying that the value at any point in the center is the weighted average of the neighboring values, uh, where the weight is given in this way. So it's all completely explicit. And actually, one of the uh, projects I've given to, to my group is some application of this to prove a fact in piadic analysis. I guess the students will talk about that on the last day. <laughs> but uh, th there are some nice concrete consequences of this formula. <coughs> Uh, there are many other nice properties of harmonic functions. So you can prove that any limit of harmonic functions is harmonic. Classically, you need uniform convergence for that to be true. Uh, here, you can get away with pointwise convergence. So it's actually nicer than the classical theory. Roughly, it's because the Poisson formula involves a finite sum. So you don't need uniform convergence to, to uh, uh, interchange limits and integrals. So what you can show is if you have a sequence of harmonic functions that are con converging pointwise to a function f, then the limit function is harmonic. And in fact, the convergence is uniform on compact sets. So this is proved using the Poisson formula. It's presumably a very icky exercise to try to use the original definition that I gave uh, in terms of directional derivatives and study this kind of thing. Um, well, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's easy from the Poisson formula. There's also an analog of Harnack's principle. So if you have a domain and an increasing sequence of non-negative functions, uh, which are each harmonic, then either the limit is plus infinity, or the limit is finite for all z, and the convergence is uniform on compact subsets. So, so the limit. Again, this is some analog of Harnack's principle, which is very useful in classical theory of harmonic functions. So many things go over into the Berkovich context with these definitions. 
and they work like their classical counterparts. So finally, I want to talk about subharmonic functions. And these also have very nice Berkovich space analogs with the right properties that you would expect. So if u is a domain, a function, I'm going to allow it to take values minus infinity, but I don't want it to be identically minus infinity. Such a function will be called subharmonic if, first of all, uh, so it should be upper semi-continuous. This is actually just coming from the classical definition. So it's convenient to allow subharmonic functions to be not necessarily continuous, but only semi-continuous. So one way to think of that is the inverse image of any half-open interval like this is open. And second, for each simple subdomain, V, so that means a simple subdomain is a simple domain whose closure is contained in U. So for each simple subdomain, V, I want to require that the, the value of F at Z is less than or equal to the weighted average of F along the boundary, right? So this is analogous to, classically, a harmonic function is where the value at the center of the disk is the average of the values, and a subharmonic function is where it's just less than or equal to the average value. So this uh, is a reasonable definition of a subharmonic function. And superharmonic means minus f is subharmonic. So, um, First remark is just that by the Poisson formula, that second condition, that was this, this main condition here, this can be replaced by the, the condition that for any simple subdomain V in any harmonic function H on V, if F is less than or equal to H on the boundary, then in fact it's less than or equal to H on all of V. And this is another, classically, this is one way to define subharmonic functions. They sort of have this property with respect to domination by harmonic functions. And a harmonic function is just one that's both subharmonic and superharmonic. That's pretty much clear from the definitions. Uh, so here's an example. If I have, again, an affinoid subdomain of P1, and U is some connected open subset, then if F is analytic on V, log absolute value F is subharmonic. So now I don't care whether it's zero or not because I'm allowing the value minus infinity. And uh, um, so such a thing is a typical, and again, this is just by analogy with what happens in uh, complex analysis that log of the absolute value of an analytic function that's possibly zero at some points should be thought of as being subharmonic. It's not harmonic at those points where it's singular, but it's subharmonic everywhere. So here's one example. If you take this funny Gromov product thing that I defined, then as a function of x, if you fix y and z, and then you think of this as a function of x, that's superharmonic in the complement of z and subharmonic in the complement of y. So as we'll see, this is connected. The Laplacian of this function is somehow supported. It's a point mass at y minus a point mass at z. And you can detect whether something's subharmonic or superharmonic by looking at whether the Laplacian is a non-negative measure. Um, so that will come up in the next lecture. But anyway, just in terms of the definitions I gave, th this is one example of such a function. And subharmonic functions obey a maximum principle. So if you have a non-constant subharmonic function on a domain, it does not achieve a global maximum on you. Uh, and, but it might achieve a global minimum, right? So for subharmonic functions, you only have a maximum principle, not a minimum principle. And uh, if you have a subharmonic function which extends continuously to the boundary, it will achieve its maximum value somewhere on the boundary by compactness. And uh, this is, uh, I think, the last slide. The, uh, finally, there's... If we look at the main dendrite, we can see, again, a characterization of subharmonic functions, or at least a, a property of subharmonic functions, that there's only finitely many tangent directions in which a subharmonic function can be increasing. What I mean by that is this, um, at, at any given point. So specifically, if I have a subharmonic function on U, 
then it's non-increasing on paths leading away from this main dendrite. So I'm not saying much about what it does on the main dendrite, but away from that, away from the paths between boundary points, uh, all the subharmonic function can do is, um, well, it's non-increasing. So it, it, it can decrease um, or remain constant, but it can't increase um, as you go away from the main dendrite. And for a disk, where the main dendrite is empty, then you have this unique boundary point. And on all paths leading away from that, a subharmonic function will be non-increasing. So anyway, this is some uh, sort of graph theoretic interpretation of what's happening with subharmonic functions and helps explain what's going on with this maximum principle. Um, but next time what I'll do is characterize all of these notions uh, in, using the notion of a Laplacian, which will construct in enough generality that it will also work for general Berkovich curves. And in that way, we, we'll be able to extend in the last lecture these notions of harmonic and subharmonic functions to more general curves uh, following the work of Thuyé. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, the, the question, if you start over a number field and you look at the, uh, have a rational map and you look at the different incarnations of, over different completions of, on P1. Is there any connection between the function theory? Um, uh, I mean, so, well, y yes, so somehow you can, you can try to set up, um, I'm not sure how to give a good immediate answer to the question, but th this is kind of the basis of uh, Trier in his thesis develops Arakelov theory along these lines where you allow, I mean, you sum over all places. Uh, I mean, you're going to define some intersection, ar arithmetic intersection numbers, which will come from local contributions. And at the infinite places, you have these usual Green's functions. And instead of the usual finite places giving you some, have intersection numbers coming from arithmetic models, you'll have functions on the Berkovich space, which are basically Green's functions on Berkovich space. I mean, it makes the theory completely symmetric. And the Green's functions, to characterize them, well, I mean, I guess they satisfy a differential equation analogous to the usual one involving a Laplacian, so I haven't defined that yet. But in particular, I mean, they will be nice uh, subharmonic functions on some appropriate locus. And so you'll have, um, I mean, that's kind of a global incarnation of the theory where you, you patch together these, uh, you know, say, subharmonic functions at all the Berkovich spaces on all completions. And when you add things up, you get some nice global uh, intersection theory. So they, they do fit together. I, I can't give a more straightforward answer than that. <laughs>